Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Vertex. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, and thanks a lot for being my audience today. Uh, let me introduce myself very quickly. My name is uh, Günther Nikodim. I am a 3D artist and visual effects artist from Austria and have been uh, working in the business for about 10 years now. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we will resurrect a T-Rex using Cinema 4D and ProRender. Uh, I have modeled uh, and rigged and animated a full model of a T-Rex. And uh, I've done this uh, totally in my spare time. This was no commercial project or there was no client behind it. And the first question is, why? Why would anybody do that? The answer is, I've been fascinated by dinosaurs since I was five. This is me with my uh, first for dinosaur model. And yeah, this fascination basically never stopped. And uh, yeah, dinosaurs are just cool. And this is why I made this model. I've also been a beta tester for now almost 10 years now for Maxon, and this project turned out to be the perfect uh, beta testing project. Uh, so every time a new version uh, from Cinema 4D is uh, published, I try to use the new features on the project, so I also try to do everything uh, directly in Cinema 4D, use no plugins, and push the tools as far as I could. And yeah, this is uh, the base model. Here you can uh, see the sculpting process where I modeled the, uh, I subdivided the model up to 14 million polygons. So I really tried to get as high as possible. And as you can see, I could even uh, sculpt all the scales and that stuff. Then I used uh, body paint to uh, paint the model. Here you can see how I used the uh, v new viewport features. Uh, I think it was added in release 19, where you can uh, see the live tessellation in the viewport and uh, the reflectance and everything. And yeah, it was also a nice playground for rigging experiments. For example, here you can see the dynamic tail, which is uh, animated automatically, or I also made a saliva setup which uh, tears apart and jiggles. I also made a fake muscle system with uh, only using Cinema 4D's deformers. And as you can see here, I also did some skin simulation. When the body moves, there are folds and wrinkles which are all generated dynamically. And this is just using uh, Cinema 4D's native tools, no plugins or whatsoever, and is fully procedural. So, now what I'm going to talk about today and what I'm going to show you live in a minute is how I used ProRender to render this T-Rex. First of all, uh, why would, you, why would somebody want to use ProRender? What are the advantages? From an artist's perspective, it is incredibly easy to use. ProRender is uh, directly integrated into Cinema 4D and works with uh, the native material system. It has very few settings, so you don't have to study tutorials or manuals. Uh, you see results immediately, which means you need to do less test renders and have a uh, faster workflow than with, for example, standard renderer or physical renderer, which don't show you the, uh, the results that quickly. And you have beautiful lighting immediately. Because what ProRender does, it is, uh, from a technical point of view, it's a physically correct path tracer, which means that you have things like global illumination or uh, caustics, uh, stuff that you, uh, with standard and physical renderer, had to activate separately, you get here basically for free, and you have it immediately. Another advantage of ProRender is that it's based on OpenCL, which means that it works on basically any graphics cards. So uh, it's developed by AMD and integrated by Maxon, but it doesn't require a certain graphics card like other renderers do. And yeah, you can use it on any system. So here are some 
example renders, which uh, show the results. And now we're going to switch live to Cinema 4D. By the way, I'm sorry for the resolution that you're seeing here. The projector that we have here is unfortunately not the best. But I hope you can see the details. So let's open this one. And yeah, here we have a T-Rex walk cycle that I animated. And let's just pick, for example, this image here. And uh, before uh, we start, uh, before we can start shading and lighting uh, this model, there are a few things I would recommend to activate or deactivate. For example, uh, the live preview here directly in the viewport works best if there are not too many polygons. So what I've done here is that I've uh, turned off the subdivision generators, which means that uh, the, polygon, uh, the, the model is not subdivided too high. Another thing is uh, displacement. As you've seen before, uh, I used the sculpting tools and uh, the model had like 14 million polygons. Uh, I baked that out to a displacement map. And here for the preview rendering, I recommend uh, turning the subdivision levels down. And later for the final rendering, uh, you can of course, uh, again, activate the generators, uh, use high subdivisions on the sub-polygon displacement. And yeah, now we can start the preview. It might take a few seconds at the beginning because uh, ProRender has to upload the scene and to uh, sometimes also to compile some new shaders. But once this is done, the preview is immediately. And now we can, for example, just change the perspective. And Yeah, maybe change here to a more interesting angle. And yeah, you can even go into the rig. Let's move the head here a tiny bit. Yeah, and the update is totally live. Here's the sum up for the fast interactive preview rendering as I told before. Reduce polygons as much as possible. Also turn off uh, things like MoGraph, for example, and uh, or cloners. I've used a uh, cloner on this object to uh, generate feathers, which I will show you in a minute. And But for the, for the design process and uh, find moods and lighting, it is best to turn off all these settings and also turn off, for example, anti-aliasing in the preview settings. And there's another thing uh, which is called a continuous material update, update which I, I'd rec recommend to turn off. So if I can find my menu here, yeah. It's here in the, in the preferences. It's called continuous material update. And what this does it's, uh, is that as soon as you move a slider of a material, it updates the image immediately. And this sometimes can slow down Cinema 4D. So if you turn this off, it's much more uh, responsive. So for example, I can now here grab the slider. And the interface and everything stays responsive while ProRender is waiting in the background until the image is updated. So yeah, uh, let's go on to the lighting process. Uh, for this scene, I've uh, used HDRIs only to light, which means that there are no light objects whatsoever in the scene. There, are only, there is only a, a sky object with an HDRI file. And the nice thing for finding moods and finding uh, different kinds of lighting situation is that you can use multiple sky objects in the scene. And uh, 
the one that is used is always the one on top. For example, I uh, named this Chi object after the HDRI that I downloaded online. And now uh, it's using this Kiara Sunset HDRI. If I want, for example, use the Cape Hill, I just put it on top and the lighting changes immediately. And Maxon also, also integrated a very nice feature in release 20, which is called Send to Picture Viewer, which grabs the current uh, uh, view and sends it to the picture viewer. And this is incredibly useful if we want to compare different renderings. For example, if I now put the previous HDRI on top again, it's gonna take some seconds until the image is updated. And now I can use this command again and have both of my images here in the picture viewer for comparison. And so what I've done here is I've rendered out all those different modes by just changing the HDRI. Now there have been uh, several features in release 20 that have been added uh, to ProRender and which turned out to be incredibly useful on this project. There was added subsurface scattering, which helps in basically any kind of material because any kind of uh, material has some sort of subsurface scattering except for some maybe very, very hard or hard surfaces like metal. And especially for skin, uh, subsurface scattering is amazing. Before that, I tried to fake it somehow with, uh, uh, with a texture in the luminance channel, but this all changed in release 20. Uh, they also added motion blur, which I will also show you in a minute. They added multipasses, which is incredibly useful for compositing. And multi-instance and color shader support for MoGraph. So uh, I've used uh, MoGraph to place feathers on the T-Rex, which is controversial if they had feathers or not, but I, uh, just for testing purposes, I gave it some feathers. And yeah, the multi-instances uh, proved to be incredibly useful and uh, color shaders, uh, the MoGraph color shader is also supported by uh, ProRender. And yeah, out of core rendering, which means that the textures don't have to be uploaded to the graphics card. They can, uh, they, yeah, so the RAM of the graphics card is freed from the texture. So here are some example renders. This is the T-Rex without subsurface scattering. And here we have it with subsurface scattering. Now here in this scene, I haven't yet activated subsurface scattering. And the workflow of how to correctly use this shader is what I'm gonna show you now. So here uh, the texture, uh, uh, the, the shading of the T-Rex is only based on the reflectance channel. We have a diffuse layer here which uses the texture and some Fresnel for, uh, which is a GGX shader with Fresnel activated and here for some extra specs I added another GGX shader. And now I've set up I've already set up the subsurface scattering shader here. It's pretty simple to use. You uh, actually only choose the colors on the surface and inside of the object, choose the depth. And yeah, it's, it's very easy to use. However, if we, if we activate it, you can see that the viewport uh, is not, the viewport display is not uh, ideal. So I'd recommend to turn off the luminance channel here in the editor settings of the material, which gives us a nice preview again, but uh, we will still have the subsurface scattering in the renderer. Okay, so let's just hit render and see how it looks. We still have the image without subsurface scattering in our picture viewer and 
once it's uh, done some iterations here, we will send it to picture viewer again and make a comparison. So I think that should be enough. Let's send it to picture viewer. And now you can see the difference immediately. immediately. It's very subtle. It's, uh, it's especially here in the mouth area, you can see uh, the difference. But what's overly noticeable is that uh, the skin shader got a lot darker than it was before. And this is because, um, because uh, ProRender is a physically correct and uh, yeah, energy conserving uh, render engine, which means that as soon as subsurface scattering is added to the material, it's not really added like it was uh, before in, uh, like we know it from standard and physical renderer. It uh, takes away something from the diffuse shading from the reflectance channel. And this is because it's uh, physically accurate. However, if for artistic reasons we want, we want it to be added, there is a simple trick which I'm gonna show you now. So here we have a strength, a strength slider, which is currently at 40%. And this means that the reflectance uh, channel is darkened by, this, uh, by these 60%. And what we can do now to compensate that is take these 60% that are left here and just divide the global reflection brightness by these 60%. So I just divided by 0 0.6. And now, if we send it to picture viewer again, you can see that the brightness is the same, but we have added the subsurface scattering effect here. You can see it here at the, in the mouth area and here on the hands especially. Yeah, maybe if we choose an angle like that and to make it more obvious, I can go into the shader and make it a bit higher. Maybe add even more depth Oh, that might be way too much, but now you can see the effect more obvious. So here are some more example renders. Here's the T-Rex in, in its classic stance that we know it didn't move that way with the tail on the ground. It was more in a horizontal position. Yeah, and here in this rendering, uh, we have actually all the new features of ProRender, or almost all of the features, uh, the new features. Uh, we have the color shader, which is used on the feathers that you see here. The feathers are actually MoGraph clones, and these MoGraph clones are using a shader field, so I also could use the new field system of Cinema Release 20, and this shader field picks up the texture color from the texture below and propagates it to the clones. So I could use the, yeah, the, the, the MoGraph color shader then to give uh, the feathers a color. What was also very useful was the introduction of multi-instances, which is an incredible fast version of instances that we have now in Cinema 4D, and uh, which is mu much faster as the render instances even, and it has also very good uh, viewport options, which I can also show you here. So here if we activate the feather system, we have here uh, a point mode, mm, I have to I'm not sure why I can't see it right now. But yeah, actually with the, uh, with the point mode, this is a very fast viewport mode, and which doesn't have to uh, display all the objects and gives you 
a very fast and uh, responsive viewport. So here we have the animation where you can also see the motion blur and all that stuff. You, you can see the subsurface scattering in the mouth. You can see the feathers, which are, uh, it's not that visible in this rendering, but they are actually moving in the wind, which was also uh, simulated with uh, MoGraph field. And yeah, motion blur is the next thing that I want to show you. So yeah, here we go. This is the walk cycle. And the nice thing about uh, ProRenders motion blur is that there is actually very little uh, hit on the render time. Because if you uh, want to use motion blur, you have uh, several, op several options which kind of mo motion blur you want to use. You have linear motion blur, which is suitable for any kind of options, objects that don't deform. But of course, for a character which deforms, we have uh, to use the subframe motion blur. And this is very similar to what has been available to standard renderer in Cinema 4D, if uh, anybody remembers that effect. It's, uh, it was the, oh, it's of course not here. It was the subframe motion blur. We also have this kind of motion blur here in ProRender. And the nice thing about that is that if you, for example, use nine samples, nine motion blur samples, you can divide your iteration count by this number. So for example, if I render a still frame with, let's say, 1,500 iterations, and I want to render this same frame with motion blur, I can just divide it by nine by the number of, uh, of motion blur samples I set here. And the render speed is actually the same. So now let's maybe drop this down to 50 and maybe only use five samples to make it quick here and render this frame to the picture viewer. And what's happening now is that, again, the scene has to be updated, but once this is done, it's uh, gonna be very quick with iterating. So as you can see here, uh, ProRender is rendering five frames with uh, 50 samples each, and these five frames are then converged together and gives us a motion blur. Of course, this is now uh, not the best quality because I used very, very low settings to show you a quick result, but this is how it works. So another thing that has been added uh, were multipasses, which are vital in anything uh, of, uh, in, in any kind of compositing that you want to do. And it's incredibly easy to use. You just uh, activate multipasses here in the render settings, uh, check the passes that you want to have. You also have the option to anti-alias them and if you render them, you get these results. Oh, here are some more renderings of the feathers. So here you can also see the wind uh, simulating some motions of the feathers and the saliva, which is tearing apart when the mouth is opened. Yeah, so back to multipasses. Here is the beauty pass that we, uh, that I've rendered out. Here's the direct illumination pass, which shows that it's uh, clearly lacking some, uh, some, some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, indirect il illumination, which looks like this. I've uh, turned up the exposure for this example, and I think this uh, shows the subsurface scattering effect and the global illumination effect uh, really well. We also get an environment pass, a depth pass, which is also often needed for compositing, and normal passes, geometry and shading normal, 
object ID passes and material ID passes. So every object and every material gets its own pass, which in this case is the same because every object has only one material, so uh, the passes are only differently colored, but we have the same amount of passes. The world coordinate and also the UV or texture coordinate. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for your attention.